Time for a roundup of the fancy relic war machines that are rarely seen on the tabletop for the Space Marines. Let's talk about the mechanical resin beasts issuing from Forge World. Hello and welcome back to War Specs Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel, where today we're going to be doing a brief unit review for basically every single generic Space Marine Forge World option in the Imperial Armour book. A few people have requested that I take a look at these, it was about a year ago now that I did that big summary of every single Space Marine unit and their strengths and weaknesses, so I thought it might be fun to branch out to the Forge World book. Of course, as I'm sure most people will be aware, Games Workshop make all the plastic Space Marine miniatures, and then over the years Forge World have made some niche resin war machines, either the really really big enormous armoured vehicles, or alternate patterns of dreadnoughts and tanks. Everything that they currently sell is in the Imperial Armour Compendium. A few of the old Space Marine kits that they made have been retired and went to the Warhammer Legends datasheet, but basically everything else in this book is fully tournament legal, and you can use them in match play games if you want to. For the purposes of this video, I thought we'd go through all the generic Forge World units, so these are the alternate patterns of vehicles and the really big super heavies, things that can be taken by any chapter, and not things like unique special characters or special character dreadnoughts, which are only locked to one specific army. Some of the special characters and things are really quite good, and hopefully we'll get around to covering them in another video at some point, if that would interest you guys. In this video though, we'll take a look at each of those generic data sheets, talk about what they do, some of their strengths, weaknesses and points costs, and how they fare against competitors within the Marine Codex or within Forge World. Of course, Forge World being Forge World, they do produce really quite a lot of big super heavy space marine vehicles. I must admit, a lot of them really aren't all that efficient at the moment, aren't very good in terms of the points cost and what they can do on the table. Even though a lot of them look really cool, they have some enormous stats on their guns, but they just aren't really efficient on a point per point basis. Just as general principles though, those really big ones often tend to do best as Iron Hand Space Marines. The Feel No Pain type save and slower degrading are both handy on the big models, but perhaps more importantly are the buffs and things that you can get on them. Getting the Iron Stone for minus one damage actually makes them somewhat survivable, and that's about the biggest target that you can apply it to. There's a couple of powerful stratagems, including one command point for Devastator Doctrine, or one command point for Exploding Sixes to Wound and some useful psychic powers that can also make them more durable, getting plus 1 to their armour save, or plus 1 to hit if you manage to cast their psychic power on an A+. Generally, if you did want to try and run something like a Falchion or an Astraeus as efficiently as possible, then Iron Hands are likely going to be the place that you'd be able to do so. In any case, let's get on with it, and we'll talk through each of the Force Organisation slots in turn, and what the vehicles can do. First up, starting in the HQ section, we have this Damocles Command Rhino, basically the stat line of a regular Rhino, and it does two main things. First up, at the start of each turn you roll a dice, and on a 5+, plus you gain one command point. And secondly, if you have any captains or lieutenants on the board, then this thing can basically broadcast their commands as well. No matter where they are on the battlefield, your models within 6 inches of the command Rhino also count as being in range of their aura. The command point thing is kind of fun, but it's only going to add up to maybe 1 or 2 CP across a 5 turn game, and that's if your command rhino survives the entire game long, which isn't all that likely. I'd say the biggest deal is that buffing aura broadcast, if you did have a captain and lieutenant on one side of the board, then you could essentially have the buffing ability of both characters also on the second side of the board as well to support another flank. In theory, if you've got enough stuff to buff, then that could well be worth it. The main issue is that the Damocles Command Rhino has kind of got passable durability with all the vicious anti-tank stuff in 9th edition these days. It's not really all that hard to just shoot dead for the points, to be honest. In general, I feel like it's more of a fun unit than one you'd want to use particularly competitively. It maybe seems like it might come into its own a bit more in really big games, when you're likely to have both of those characters on the board, and seeding one in in the middle of a secondary formation could be kind of fun. Overall, I've chosen to rank it a 6 out of 10. Potentially very good buffing abilities for the points, but certainly has its drawbacks. Next up, we come to the Dreadnought Drop Pod. It basically does what it says on the tin, drops one Dreadnought into the battle on turn 1, and still charge you a 70 point price tag to do so. You can only use it on Dreads with 9 wounds or less, so that's going to be Contemptors or regular Dreads for the most part. You're not going to be able to deploy things like Redemptors or Leviathans this way. Basically, you're paying 70 points to put a Dreadnought exactly where you need it turn 1, it isn't the worst thing in the world, and it means that you get some optimal shooting and the chance of a first turn charge, but I just don't really feel for the 9 wound or less dreadnoughts, it's really a price that's going to be worth paying for 70 points. It doesn't have any armament, and it's also a mobile as well, which can be a bit of a liability, potentially having your opponent hug the drop pod to stop them being shot. Maybe for certain character dreadnoughts, it could be more borderline worth it, 
but I think he's still paying quite a lot of points for Deep Strike, and he could just start the Dreadnoughts on the board, or use Strategic Reserve if he did want a bit of outflanking shenanigans. I've chosen to rank it a 5 out of 10. Not really the most efficient, but it could be a fun addition to some first turn Deep Striking Devastators, maybe. More positively, on the transport front is the Terax Pattern Termite Drill. This one I do have quite a lot more time for, though it does seem a lot more popular amongst Heretics and Admech than it is in the Space Marine Army. The drill does cost 180 points, so it is an investment for a transport, but you get quite a big threat in addition to the transport capacity. It's 14 wounds and toughness 8, so quite durable. Shoots with 5 melter guns when it comes in. Has some fairly efficient Volkites to back that up, and if it gets in combat with a vehicle, then it's really going to chew it up. 3 attacks hitting on 3s, with a massive D3 plus 6 damage, provided you are attacking a vehicle. Otherwise, it basically works very similar to a drop pod, but you can't come down turn 1 like drop pods can. It transports 12 infantry, and once you drill up onto the board, you get to get those infantry out so they can attack as well. I feel like in general, it's a bit more rarely seen in the loyalists because it's competing with the very cheap drop pot that allows you the big alpha strike, say with a bunch of graph cannons. But overall, as marine vehicles go, I think it's still relatively strong. I've chosen to rank it an 8 out of 10. I think the drill itself is quite good. Perhaps the main issue is the amount of stuff that it can transport. It's locked out of carrying really quite a lot of choices, including sadly Primaris models. I've chosen to rank it an 8 out of 10 though. I think if it had something good to deliver, then we'd see it a fair bit more. Next up, into the Elite section, and we have the Derradeo Dreadnought. 190 points base, though you can upgrade it with a few extra things to make it shoot better. This one's basically a dedicated long-range firing platform Dreadnought, and can be specced to specifically go after aircraft with this Boreas air defense missile system that gives you more damage against aircraft. In general, its damage isn't too bad. My favourites are probably the Plasma Carronade and the Volkite Falconet Battery. Both of those are pretty decent general purpose damage output. Its defence is kind of okay, with 12 wounds, toughness 7 and a 5 plus invul plus duty eternal, but its big issue is that it doesn't get core like the Redemptor, so it isn't going to be able to get any nice buffs like that. has the relic keyword and martial legacy, meaning that you're paying an extra command point to bring it along, and I just generally feel that this guy is overshadowed by things like Contemptors, Redemptors and Leviathan Dreadnoughts, to the extent where, while it's not bad, I think it's rarely ever going to be the best choice. I've chosen to rank it a 6 out of 10, a usable fire platform, just a bit mediocre compared with other things, particularly stuff that has core. Moving on, we come to the Leviathan Dreadnought, starting at 220 points base, and a bit meatier on the defence side, having 14 wounds, that 5 plus invul save again, and now a 2 plus armour save as well. Still definitely a lot less tanky than it was back in 8th edition though. Again, it doesn't have the core keyword, which is a disadvantage, but seeing as it's such a big firing platform in itself, it's maybe quite a good combo with chapter tech marines, giving it the plus one to hit and some healing. I think a fair few of the options are worth taking. The Storm Cannon and the Grav Flux Bombard are both interesting. Probably the Grav Flux Bombard is my favourite. And you do have the option of taking a melee arm alongside it, so you've got a bit of counter charge threat as well. The two twin Volkite Calibers can put out a surprising amount of damage as well. And you can also take a trio of Hunter Killer Missiles, which are quite a big threat when combined all in one big shot. In general, while it might be slightly tougher than Redemptors for the points, they still will be the go-to general purpose Dreadnought, as they both shoot about as well as this, and also fight well in combat, and particularly as there's a fair few sources of getting a 5 plus invul save for Dreadnoughts, which can kind of bring up the Redemptors to more of the Leviathan's level of durability. Still though, for non-core gun platforms, it's really not too bad comparatively. I've chosen to rank the Leviathan a 7 out of 10. Next up though, we perhaps have the very strongest out of any of the Space Marine Forge World units, and that's the Relic Contemptor Dreadnought. Certainly a ridiculously popular staple of tournament scenes over the last year or so. Those twin Volkite Culverins just get into work on basically any target almost equally efficiently. Unlike the previous two, the Contemptor does have the core keyword, and you really do have a whole ton of flexibility with this guy. You've got various melee weapon choices, plus secondary weapons to go alongside them, the choice of the vast majority of the Space Marine heavy weapon pool, those twin Volkite Culverins themselves, which did go up in points, but they're still very efficient, particularly with chapters that can reliably get AP-1 on them each turn, and a Cyclone Missile Launch is very tempting to put on the top as well for 25 points. Adds a bit more anti-tank threat for relatively cheap. I still think that these guys are very good indeed. I've chosen to rank them a 9 out of 10. I think they would have been an unmitigated 10 out of 10 before the Volkite Culverin nerf. Now though, I think they are a fair bit more balanced against other options. I'd probably say the Redemptor is a tiny bit stronger than these guys now but still it's great to have a core datasheet with quite so much crazy flexibility. 
Next up, back in the fast attack choice, and we have the Death Storm Drop Pod. This is the drop pod that hurtles towards the enemy, lands nearby, and instead of disgorging troops, it just opens up with a massive barrage of missiles or cannon shots. It has a rule fairly similar to that Hammerfall bunker, where basically its cannon or missile arrays will target every single thing that's eligible within 18 inches, and make one attack at ballistic skill 4 against all of them. The cannon gets 6 shots at strength 6, AP-1, damage 1. The missile array gets 2 shots at strength 8, AP-2, damage D6. And I must admit, out of those, I do feel that the missile array is probably the better of the two. It does kind of depend on what army you're fighting, though. In general, though, with its relatively high points cost of 120 to 130, I think it's very rarely going to do anything near enough damage to justify itself. The enemy would just have to be super clustered up. And even then, while it might do some fairly decent damage, it's very unlikely to kill anything just with the profile that it's got. It also has the same issue as most drop pods, being immobile, so relatively weak to being targeted and tied up, so it could become almost as much of a liability as it is a help. I've chosen to rank it a 4 out of 10, definitely a bit overcosted for what it does. Certainly seems like a fun unit to use though, particularly if your opponent decides against trying to mitigate it and decides just to cluster up really tightly. You could potentially get a decent amount of missile hits if there's loads and loads of units in range, I guess. Staying with the fast attack, and we have the Javelin Attack Speeder. This one's a slightly heavier land speeder variant with 125 points base and gets 9 wounds at toughness 6. For an extra 20 points, you could upgrade to a multi melter and throw a couple of Hunter Killer missiles on it as well. That could make it into genuinely quite a dangerous Alpha Strike vehicle, packing 7 anti tank shots right off the bat and then 5 shots from then. Not really too bad firepower, I think, particularly given how fast it is, and that it's usually going to get the jump on the enemy rather than the other way around. Really though, I don't think it's particularly better than any of the standard land speeder variants. It's particularly not going to compete very well against core attack bikes, which have kind of similar durability and also better firepower. And on a fairly cheap vehicle, that Relic and Martial Legacy thing isn't very helpful. Having to spend a command point for a fairly cheap unit is a bit annoying. Overall though, I think it has its merits. Could be quite an annoying little threat in the right army and played well. I've chosen to rank it 6 out of 10. It's maybe not too dissimilar for the Land Speeder Tempest. This guy's a Land Speeder variant with an extra wound. It packs a Assault Cannon and then a Tempest Salvo Launcher, which is basically a Cyclone Missile Launcher with a bit more AP. 115 points seems reasonably well balanced versus standard Land Speeders for what you get there. Again, nice and fast, relatively bad defence. Somewhat comparable with things like land speeders, and a bit worse than attack bikes that have core, in my opinion. Moving on to flyers now, and besides the super heavy ones, we have three. This guy is the dreaded Fire Raptor gunship, really quite an enormous space marine flyer, packing a whole bunch of heavy bolters. With those two quad heavy bolter turrets in place, it'll cost you a big 400 points, and for that you get a toughness 7 flyer with 18 wounds, a whopping 24 heavy bolter shots, 4 hellstrike missile shots with strength 8, damage 3, and on the prow a Twin Avenger Bolt Cannon, which isn't really too dissimilar from the Imperial Knight one, only 10 shots but strength 6, AP-2, damage 2. As it goes, firepower wise it isn't actually too bad in my opinion. For the amount of points you pay you get a relatively decent amount of guns on this thing, and flyer movement should allow it to basically see what it wants to. The biggest issue really is the defence, only 18 toughness 7 wounds for 400 points is really quite bad, even if you are minus 1 to hit, and I feel with the enormous size of this thing, it's going to be kind of hard to hide it, and very bad news if you do run into something with quality long-ranged anti-tank firepower. You really don't want to be facing Tau with any sort of rail weapons with this thing. It is quite fun though, has an absolute ton of quality dice shots to roll, and maybe isn't a bad choice for sticking all those Iron Hands buffs on it, maybe trying to improve its save, better ballistic skill, and using the Ironstone. Its transport partner in crime, and more expensive resin cousin of the Storm Raven gunship, is the Storm Eagle gunship. Stats wise, maybe it isn't so different from the Fire Raptor, but just swapping out a fair few guns for some transport capacity, meaning it's far worse of a firing platform, but can carry really quite a big contingent of people in its hold, 20 chapter infantry, with the option to transport jump packs, wolfen or centurions, though of course Primaris Marines are far too selective to get in this thing. In my opinion, with the same defensive profile, it just seems decently worse than the Fire Raptor. Losing out on that many guns for a transport capacity just doesn't really seem worth it to me. Maybe it could be fun if you wanted to deliver a massively tricked out Resinue in really really big games, but in more normal sized 2000 point games of 40k, I just don't think it's very efficient. Thirdly for the main flyer choices we have the Xiphon Interceptor. This thing is really quite an expensive light flyer at 235 points, and has 12 wounds at toughness 7, 
packing two twin LAS cannons and a Zyphon missile battery with three shots at strength 7, AP minus 2 and damage 3. Basically four good anti-tank shots, three good-ish ones that are a little bit better against aircraft, and seems like it could be a reasonable choice just for staying as far away from the enemy as possible. Its guns are 48 inch in range, so hopefully should be able to get a turn or two of damage dealing without being able to get shot at all. If he can keep it safe for multiple turns, it should do enough damage to pay for itself, but it does feel quite similar to some of the other options in a Space Marine non-core shooting platform that's paying a lot for its mobility, and just doesn't have enough damage output to really make you want to take it. Moving on to the heavy support section next, and we'll start off with the Land Raider Achilles, costing around about 300 to 340 points for a Land Raider with a quad launcher, and then packing either twin Volkite Culverins or Multi-Melters on the side sponsons. The quad launcher is really quite a decent upgrade over the more standard twin heavy bolter. You either get four solid anti-tank shots at 24 inch range, or a thunderfire cannon ignoring line of sight type of profile, 60 inches barrage weapon with strength 4 and AP 0. Between the quad launcher and the multi-melters, it can be putting out a pretty decent amount of anti-tank fire up fairly close, and it does have a small transport capacity as well, which you might be able to use to hide something in it opportunistically. Perhaps another good fun option for layering buffs such as iron hands things, iron stones and hitting on twos, but I think in general it's not really going to be any better or tougher than its equivalent amount in core gun platforms, as is often the case with comparing just about any other shooting in the Space Marine Codex, you might easily be better off with its weight in points in things like Contemptor or Redemptor Dreadnoughts. Still though, a very snazzy looking Land Raider, particularly painted up in Minotaur's goldy bronze here. The other Land Raider variant in the heavy support slot is the Land Raider Proteus. This is the one that harks back to the style of the very early Land Raiders that came out back in 40k's distant past. It's kind of like a slimmed down Land Raider with 235 points rather than the normal 265, but basically doesn't get the twin heavy bolter at base, which you can upgrade back to. I guess it's kind of interesting that you can swap out those twin heavy bolters for something else, like a single multi-melter, which might actually be preferable. And it does have a couple of fun upgrades as well. 15 points each, either for an Explorator Augury Array or Heavy Armor. The Array prevents nearby enemy Deep Strikers in a similar way to Infiltrators. Kind of a powerful tool to have to be honest, whether it's holding down a backfield objective or setting up in the midfield somewhere. And Heavy Armor for 15 points can give it a 5 plus Invul save. Not a bad thing to be sure, but bear in mind with its already good 2 plus armor save, it's only going to matter against AP-4 weapons or better. To be honest, at the moment I kind of rate it very similar to the standard Land Raider. Maybe a little bit more superior to that with its extra options and different weapon choices. Still though, that's not the most favourable comparison. I think out of the Forge World Land Raiders, I would prefer the Achilles just with its massive anti-tank threat. I've chosen to rate this guy a 5 out of 10. Sticking with the guns, and next we have the Rapier Carrier. 75 points base for a Toughness 5, 5 wound model. Very slow movement, and packs either 4 heavy bolters, a Graviton Cannon, a Laser Destroyer, or a Quad Launcher. A few of the profiles are kind of interesting. For the 75 points, the quad heavy bolter I think is actually quite efficient. It is perhaps one of the best damage dealers packing bolt weapons in the entire Space Marine range, so that's going to be particularly nice if you're playing something like Imperial Fists, who get the exploding sixes to hit as well as ignores cover. For the same cost, I think it far outcompetes the Graviton Cannon. And then if you upgrade 435 points extra, you either have the choice of the Laser Destroyer or the Quad Launcher. The Laser Destroyer is 3 shots at strength 10, AP minus 4, damage D3 plus 3. Pretty decent damage output to be honest, but when you're paying 110 points for the model, it's just going to be very easy to kill in return. And the Quad Launcher is the same as the one on the Achilles, either a barrage long range profile or an anti-tank short range one. For weaknesses, it certainly doesn't have all that much movement, although you can still move and shoot 4 inches, so at least you can hide out of sight behind terrain and move into it and even at the lower end of the spectrum, it is fairly easy to kill for the points invested. Despite that though, I think those quad heavy bolters for 75 points really aren't too bad in terms of non-core gun platforms. I feel like a trio of these in an Imperial Fist army really isn't going to be such a bad investment. That'd be a pretty impressive tirade of bolt shots going down range. Overall, I've ranked it a 7 out of 10. That's assuming using the heavy bolters, and using them in an army that makes sense too. Next up, we have the Sakaran tank series. For the most part they're kind of similar, for the most part the main difference is the different turret that they get. In terms of tank chassis, I think that the Sakarans do a little bit better than quite a lot of the core codex ones. The entry point for them tends to be around about 170 points, including secondary weapons, but for that you get a fairly decent defensive profile. Toughness 7, 14 wounds and a 2 plus save isn't that easy to take out. 
and for battle tanks they are also kind of spectacularly fast as well, moving 14 inches. Out of the tanks, I think that probably the best is the Sakaran Arcus, that's the one that gets 2d6 shots at strength 6, AP minus 1, damage 2, and it can fire them out of line of sight. As Space Marine Artillery goes, that is one of the more efficient choices, can be a fairly easy one to sit back, hold a home field objective, blast out that shooting each turn, and maybe even be a target for to the last, as it's going to be quite hard to dig out with that good profile and hopefully hiding. I think the others are all kind of reasonable for the points, but just don't really do all that much special that other gun platforms don't. The Omega and the Venator, they both do very decent damage against tanks, both of them having their weaknesses. The Venator has to stay still to get its neutron laser firing at a max 6 damage, and the Omega packs a really big plasma weapon, so it has the chance to take a few mortal wounds. Then there's the Punisher that gets 18 shots at strength 6, AP minus 1, damage 1. That'll chew through hordes okay if you do need a bit more anti-infantry clearance. And I think that perhaps actually the most overshadowed of any of them is the standard Sakaran battle tank. I feel like its Heracles pattern battle cannon is just a little bit underpowered. 6 shots at strength 7 and damage 3. They do have the downsides of being relics so will cost you a command point. And like so many others of these guns the direct damage ones will struggle against core dreadnoughts. Over the tank series I generally rate them between a 6 and an 8. The 8 being for the Sakaran Arcus which is one of the most competitive Space Marine tanks about at the moment, I think, and I have seen used a few times in tournament lists. Next up, we really have the quite fun Vindicator Laser Destroyer, the Vindicator that instead of packing a Demolisher Cannon, just packs a massive Laser Volley Cannon instead, though seems to perform much the same role. The Volley Cannon fires at heavy 3 shots, strength 10, AP minus 4, and a massive flat damage of 6, though it does have the small chance to overheat a bit if it does move and shoot at that profile. It's basically 175 points for that massive gun, reasonably tough as well as it is of Indicator with toughness 8 and 11 wounds, but to be honest despite the massive fun factor, it is arguably still less efficient than a standard Vindicator, kind of similar damage output against hard targets, and comparably a fair bit worse in defence for the points, as the standard Vindicator costs less and has the Seed Shield. Its damage output is still very swingy as well, depending on whether or not you actually get those big damage 6 shots through, though admittedly a bit less so than the standard Vindicator with those D6 profiles. Really quite a fun model though, has a fairly decent range, still a bit middle of the road for efficiency though, I've chosen to rank it a 6 out of 10. Finally for the heavy support section we have the Relic Whirlwind Scorpius, yet another fairly decent option for Space Rain Ignore's line of sight shooting, this one hits with 3d3 shots at strength 6, AP minus 2, damage 2. Being the same points as the Sakaran Arcus, it does also have a very similar gun in terms of damage output, loses a shot, gains a pip of AP, but if the enemy does draw a bead on it, it's far easier to take out, not having the 2 plus save or 14 wounds, and doesn't pack a heavy bolter as an additional weapon. I think these things are still kind of fine though, and certainly arguably one of the strongest ignores line of sight weapons in the Space Marine arsenal. In general, I think I'd be a bit more tempted by the Arcus over this, but I admit that they both have their advantages. I've chosen to rank it a 7 out of 10, OK ignores line of sight shooting that you pay a bit of an expected premium for. Next up we have the Tarantula Sentry Battery, this one's a fortification choice, basically unmanned Space Marine Sentry Guns that either pack heavy bolters or las cannons, in theory they're put down to deny the enemy ground, you can take between 1 and 3 models in the unit, for 40 points with heavy bolters or 50 points with las cannons. Being automated they have to target either the closest infantry or vehicle each turn, and do so with their twin weapons at a ballistic skill of 4+, plus, and kind of have a middling defence, toughness 5, 4 wounds and a 3 plus save. In general though, I really don't find these things very impressive at all. Being a mobile is a pretty bad thing in 9th edition, it means that if your opponent actually cares about their shooting they might well be able to hide. Their damage output is kind of mediocre, a lot of mobile space marine units that fight in combat will do better. It doesn't get core, it has those targeting issues, and it's very vulnerable to modifiers as well. If the enemy has a minus 1 to hit, these guys are going to care about it far more than most space marines. I've chosen to rank them a 3 out of 10, they will put out a bit of heavy weapon fire, but the vast majority of other gun platforms are going to be more efficient. Finally though, we get into the really big stuff of the Space Marine Codex, the Lords of War, and we'll start out with the mighty Astrius, the Primaris Super Heavy, a huge hovering gun platform on those massive grav plates. The Astrius weighs in at a cool 600 points at base, its toughness 8 with 30 wounds and a 2 plus save, and also gets a couple of void shields as well to hopefully shrug the first few rounds of damage. Its primary gun is a twin macro accelerator cannon, 12 shots at strength 8, AP minus 2, damage 3. Very general purpose, but to be honest this thing has to be killing something major each turn, seeing as it costs so many points. 
Besides that, it's got a twin heavy bolter and side sponsons of either plasma eradicators or las rippers. I feel the plasma weapons are far more interesting to be honest. D6 shots at strength 8, AP minus 4 and damage 3. Again, those two combined are going to tear another hefty chunk out of something. Overall, I think as the Lords of War go, it is actually one of the most efficient Space Marine ones going. Reasonable generalist firepower, and it could be a decent one to concentrate all of your buffs on. Give it an Iron Stone, plus one to hit, and an extra plus one armor save, and then spend a command point to turn to keep it in the Devastator Doctrine, and give that main gun some decent AP. Still though, realistically, it's not going to be quite as strong as investing all those points in more efficient, lighter gun platforms. It doesn't split fire all that well, and for the points invested, the damage is a bit underwhelming, though you can certainly say the same of basically every single other Space Marine Lord of War that we're going to talk about. Titanic units do have their own disadvantages as well, costing you extra CP, not being able to get chapter tactics, and not interacting too well with terrain. Overall though, as one of the more efficient Space Marine Lords of War, I've chosen to rank him a 5 out of 10. Not exactly a model that you take along to win a tournament, but with a fair bit of support, could become a somewhat efficient gun platform. Moving on, we have what appears to be the mutant offspring of a land raider and a Vindicator laser destroyer. The Cerberus is a Space Marine Titanic land raider, akin to a Spartan, and it packs a pretty crazy Cerberus neutron pulse array, which is heavy 4 in shot, strength 14, AP minus 4, damage 2d3, and if you remain stationary, goes up to a 6. For that privilege, you pay 400 points for it, and it's mounted on a 20 wound land raider chassis, that unfortunately doesn't have any sort of invul. You do have the option to pile on a few more sponsons or secondary weapons onto it, a few las cannons or a multi-melter maybe, but I think really as Lords of War go, there's just not really all that much positive to say about this guy. If it doesn't have a really hard target to shoot, then that pulse laser is going to be kind of wasted, and you're going to have to weigh up between moving and shooting to full effect each turn. Generally in 9th edition you can't afford to have something this strong stay still. Its defence is actually surprisingly poor for the price tag, basically barely any tougher than a standard Space Marine Land Raider, which costs almost half the price. And while it won't be locked up as a Titanic vehicle, it has all the problems that the Astrius has that we just talked about, Lord of War command points and chapter tactics and terrain problems, and also is a relic as well, costing an extra CP with Martial Legacy. Overall, a ranked 2 out of 10. A fun idea perhaps, but the numbers just don't really back it up all that well at all. Next up we have one of the Space Marine Baneblade equivalents, the Falchion. This one's a 600 point, 26 wounds, 2 plus save behemoth that sports a fairly mighty twin Falchion Volcano Cannon, 2d3 shots at strength 14, AP minus 5, damage 6, kind of similar to that Cerberus, but without being prevented from moving. It supplements that with some pretty massive secondary weapons that you get built in as well, two quad las cannons as the sponsons, also has a twin heavy bolter, and can pick up another few options if you want, including laser destroyers instead of those quad las cannons. Basically all of these don't have the best damage or defence for the big points cost, they all have the Lord of War issues, but I think perhaps as they go, I prefer this Falchion to the Cerberus quite a bit. Its defence is still pretty bad for the points, but at least it has a bit more of a convincing damage output, and no problems with movement to go with it. Its cousin the Fellblade on the other hand, I do feel is really quite a lot worse than the Falchion right now. The Fellblade Accelerator Cannon is perhaps a bit more flexible, either being able to choose between high explosive shells or AE shells, but the anti-tank profile basically has half the damage of the Falchions, and the high explosive shells aren't really much more impressive than a standard guard battle cannon. I think you just need something a little bit more impressive than that on a tank this big, otherwise it's basically the same points cost and has the same extra options as the Falchion, so I basically place it as flatly inferior to that, I've chosen to score it a 2 out of 10. Next up we have the most expensive ground bound Lord of War. This one's the Mastodon and weighs in the 800 points, basically the gargantuan space marine transport, capable of carting around almost half a company of marines. Aside from looking thoroughly imposing, it's also one of the only units in 40k to have a big toughness of 9. I could genuinely vex quite a lot of armies anti-tank, particularly if they're spamming a whole load of strength 8 lances or something. And for your 800 points you get 30 wounds at a 2 plus save, and a couple of void shields as well. Its primary purpose does seem to be delivering loads and loads of space marines, and it has a huge transport capacity of 40 infantry, and I find it really quite funny that it can also transport dreadnought models as well. I believe technically rules as written, it can even transport redemptor dreadnoughts if it wants to. It's not allowed to take anything with the primaris keyword anymore, but they removed the primaris keyword from the redemptor in the last space marine codex. Kind of hilarious having a tank that carries around walking tanks. In terms of weapons, it gets a Siege Melter Array, 
essentially three multi melters strapped together, a few last cannons and heavy flamers, and then a Sky Reaper battery. Eight shots at strength seven, AP minus two, damage two, that is actually fairly lethal against aircraft, getting damage four against them. Compared with the other Lords of War, this thing's damage is absolutely pitiful for 800 points, though it does seem like one of the best ways of almost guaranteeing an alpha strike with anything within it. I think it is few armies that are going to be able to chew through one of these in a single turn, even with 9th edition very high damage weapons. Again, certainly not really in any way efficient, but just for the sheer joy of trundling a massive transport with dreadnoughts inside it towards the enemy, I'm sure it could be quite good fun to use in game. Next up we have the Sokar Pattern Stormbird, one of the two current super heavy flyers winging about. This one's going to cost you an awful lot to put on the table though, at a thousand points in one big model. All concentrated into 40 toughness 8 wounds with void shields at a minus 1 to hit as it's a flyer. This thing has got a frankly ridiculous transport capacity, no less than a massive 50 chapter infantry models. And this and the Thunderhawk are perhaps some of the only models that can transport Primaris around. And kind of hilariously, while it can't take dreadnoughts, this thing can have a rhino transported in the hold, a rare case of being able to transport a transport. Despite being pretty tough and having a huge points cost though, it's really got next to no damage output whatsoever. A few Hellstrike missiles, three twin heavy bolters and four twin last cannons are kind of something that you might expect for a model with half its points or less, and is maybe one of the worst value Lords of War for actually dealing damage. Being a flyer as well, it's not even going to be able to help out with objectives as much, even just parking it on one of those. I think if I were taking a super heavy flyer, I'd be a lot more tempted by the Thunderhawk, at least that's got some fun guns. I've chosen to rank this one a 2 out of 10. Next up we come to the Spartan, 460 points worth of land raider on steroids, kind of like the Cerberus though, for the massive extra points increase, it isn't actually all that more tanky, only going up to 20 wounds from 16. It does get a few more last cannon shots though, with two quad last cannons compared with the more standard four that a normal land raider has, and can take a pintle mountain multi melter if you want that as well. Its transport capacity is also pretty huge as well, 25 models can fit in here. Interestingly, I do feel that despite being really quite a lot less efficient than Land Raiders in terms of damage and defence, it might actually do its job a little bit better, as unlike Land Raiders, this thing doesn't care about being stuck in combat at all due to Titanic, so it means that you can kind of safely trundle all those guns towards the enemy, and not worry about having all that firepower locked up just because some stray grot has touched your tracks. Still though, sadly really not all that efficient in terms of damage or defence, I've ranked it a 4 out of 10 for similar reasons to the other Lords of War. Next up we have the Mighty Mighty Thunderhawk, 800 points worth of iconic Space Marine model, though perhaps a little bit easier to kill than the Stormbird, with only 30 wounds, a 2 plus save, and no invul or void shields on this guy. It still transports more infantry than you're likely to really need to be honest, and actually it does have some guns worth mentioning this time, a Thunderhawk Heavy Cannon or Turbo Laser Destructor. Both of them kind of have their merits really, a Heavy Cannon is going to be a bit more general purpose with Strength 8, AP-2, Damage D3 plus 2, and Heavy 2D6 shots. The Turbo Laser Destructor only gets a slightly unimpressive 3, but they are at Strength 16, AP-5, Damage 6, so likely they are going to get felt. It also gets a Mortal Wound Bomb Attack that I'd swap out for the Hellstrike Missile Battery, that's 4 anti-tank shots for the same price. And like the Stormbird has a fair few secondary weapons, 4 Twin Heavy Bolters and 2 Last Cannons. Again, its damage or even its defence for 800 points really isn't going to win any prizes. It's a flyer that isn't going to take objectives, but you do get the fun of flying around with one of the most iconic Space Marine models. This thing really would be a massive hunk of flying resin. Finally, in the Lords of War, we come to the Typhon. Maybe not so dissimilar from the Cerberus. This one's basically a Spartan cross between a Vindicator, and its Dreadhammer Siege Cannon gets 2d6 shots, a strength 10, AP-4, and damage 3. I feel that on the whole maybe it's a little bit more efficient than the Cerberus, just due to costing 50 points less and not having movement issues, but still not so dissimilar that it might actually be good. Still though, I'm never really going to say no to the fun factor of this. With the Typhon that makes us more or less done, so I hope you've enjoyed a quick summary of just about every Forge World unit that isn't chapter locked. In general, at least where Space Marines are concerned, I do feel that Forge World really doesn't translate to too strong these days. I feel that in general people just have that connotation from it, just because the models that actually tend to see play do tend to be the strong ones, even if there's a whole load of things under the surface that just really aren't that great. I do feel it's probably in Games Workshop's design philosophy a bit, not to have the really really big stuff be the most effective thing that you can field, 
I feel like it's probably not the look that they want for the game, for everyone just bringing one enormously expensive chunk of resin to the board and winning without too much thought against people who can't afford them. In any case, out of these units, I'd say perhaps the best of the bunch are these ones. I feel like the Relic Contempt to Dreadnought is perhaps the best. Flexible Volkite Culverins or Battery of Last Cannons and Cyclone Missile Launchers with the core keyword can be really good, particularly in certain chapters like Iron Hands where they can hide the Dreadnought with the character keyword. The Takeran Arcus and the Whirlwind Scorpius are perhaps the two most efficient Ignore's Land of Sight weapons in Space Marines, still paying a bit of a premium, and I think there is an argument for the regular Whirlwind as it does have that nice fight's last stratagem. The Leviathan Dreadnought I think is a pretty reasonable advanced gun platform, fairly tough and very scary with those grav bombards and volkites. The termite drill I think is maybe a little bit underrated as a transport, perhaps overshadowed by drop pods, and I do quite like the quad heavy bolter rapier battery. Against the right armies they could be really brutal, particularly if you're playing imperial fists. Some of the special characters are also pretty interesting, maybe we'll get round to covering them in their own video at some point soon. So let me know what you think then. Which are your favourite Space Marine Forge World toys? Which ones do you think are perhaps best in game? And which ones do you most want to see an update for? Look forward to hearing all your thoughts and opinions down in the comments as always. Finally, if you have enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, where I'll certainly keep the regular 40k stuff coming, with new stuff out just about every day. We'll certainly have plenty more on the way for the Space Marines. Finally, if you have enjoyed the video, I would just like to mention one way in which you can help support the channel and that's the All Specs Tactics Patreon page down in the video description below. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some really big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, then the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.